Before we begin, I always want to thank the experts in this panel. Uh, I will introduce you uh, now, but uh, essentially the whole spirit of this Course House um, initiative has been to connect the people that have field experience and, and project experience with people that are seeking that uh, know-how that doesn't come maybe from the classroom, but comes from the field. So today um, we're doing the first of our four uh, webinar series. Uh, we have planned the year with four uh, webinars. So maybe, um, Elke, if you want to go to the next slide. The first one, it's about the consistent coordination problems. Um, I also have been in this industry for 20 years and I have heard kind of like the same story, like if it was scripted in different countries and different projects and different uh, contexts. So today, my expectation is that we'll get from, from these three gentlemen um, what their views are. And this is coming from three very different views. So I will introduce you to our panel today. Um, first, uh, Alberto here is a friend and an architect. He's from Chile. Uh, we came across back in uh, 2007 or something when you were at Leo Daily, now working at Hansen Phelps. He's a, a very technical-minded design architect, which is rare. <laughs> so um, for me, Albert, it's a pleasure to have you here. I appreciate it. And I'm very much looking forward to your uh, thoughts today. Um, Thank you. All right. Uh, Alex, I met Alex uh, through Stella uh, two years ago. As I say, a young, bright mind and very courageous to open the business and, and pursue a very specific line of development in the Hollywood area or so. Um, <clears throat> having had already an opportunity to develop a couple of projects, we came across a small coordination exercise uh, a few months back. And I think your view today, Alex, as a younger developer that understands the power of technology that comes from a different generation, I mean, like it or not, uh, I mean, you like it, I may not. <laughs> um, you have a different view of things and that I think will be a very great uh, added value. So thank you, Alex, for, for joining. Of course, thank you. Um, so Jason, as I was saying, couldn't make it. Uh, I wanted him to be as a, as a different, I mean, I met him in person. It's a, it's, I, I appreciate his views on technology. I think as a developer, that is the reason I wanted Jason in this uh, webinar, but unfortunately he couldn't make it. And last, but by far not least, Greg Snacko. I met him uh, or I came across you, I don't know, like five, six years ago. I've been following the developments and I would like if you could give us your short pitch on, on your development, because I think there's a great story that has a lot to do with what we're talking about or what we, we will be talking about today. So thank you so much, uh, Greg, for, for joining us as well. Yeah, thank you very much. Did you want me to lead off with a little explanation? I would, I would, yep, if you don't mind, we can okay. start with. All right, we're, we're a mechanical, electrical, plumbing and fire protection engineering company. Uh, our home base is in Omaha, Nebraska. We have uh, offices in six locations around the country. Um, we've been in business since uh, 1968 and uh, we have developed uh, an artificial intelligence software program for mechanical, electrical and plumbing engineering. Uh, basically, we don't what draw the wires, pipes, and ducts that go into our designs anymore. Uh, it's completely uh, computer generated. Um, the way the system works is we identify the requirements of the building in terms of the points of utilization. That would be the outlets, the lights, the uh, plumbing fixtures, HAC equipment, whatever it is. And then we identify the locations or sources of supply for those uh, particular building system utilities. At that point, the human engineering is finished. Uh, we turn it over to the software and the software iterates through tens of thousands of alternative design solutions, uh, basing its decisions on uh, the cost of construction, both labor and materials, uh, in order to find the optimum design. So uh, whereas a human engineered system, you get uh, the human designer's uh, opinion based on knowledge, training and experience of what he thinks you should do. Uh, we're studying all the alternatives and determining what truly is the best solution for the uh, software. The output of, this, uh, of the software is a fully uh, CD and permit ready uh, CAD drawings and a full Revit model of the uh, successful solution. 
It's uh, both uh, interesting and scary, let me tell you that. Um, for, for those of us who, I mean, I know Alex will probably be, you know, more interested in, in learning uh, about all this. But I believe, Greg, that us, like professionals from this industry, like we had a, a panel with the AIA on Friday, and there was a lot about automation and, you know, this AI thing that for some reason we all tend to think that it will, it will not bother us, it will be another's you know, you know, industry's problems. But with what you're saying, I think it kind of like opens the door to this uh, session of questions. Appreciate that. Um, just for the guys that have joined in the in the past few minutes, uh, the we will be having a couple of questions and I want to hear the thoughts of uh, everybody in the panel. And with that said, I think we're ready to go. And we will, there's no background to share. We will just have a, a friendly conversation here. But I wanted to start, and remember the, the value of today for me is the, as you said, Greg, there's so much the software can do, but there's some experience you gain with, with field experience. And I'm always intrigued by patterns. Uh, I would wanna hear from you guys with the experience you've had. If, if you could tell everybody, there's, if there's one consistent problem, if there's, you know, specifically something that you go like, this is this is always in the picture. This coordination problem always shows up. What would that be? I, I, I can start on that, but right. I, actually I don't have just one, I have several of them. So. <laughs> but I, I'm gonna tell you one, I, I, I think it's, it's important and it relates to what um, uh, Greg was saying, the design, usually it's never ready. And when it comes to the construction company and it goes to our sub, the design that it was done by the consultant, it misses a lot of information. When it goes to the sub, the sub tend to finish that design. And it creates some friction between teams, but it's because the drawings were not completed. And it, it has several, uh, ramifications, but but I think when you Greg is talking about that new program, it resolved that that problem because you will now have something that is in a way finished. Sure. Um, the the other part is, and I'm I'm not sure how you uh, Greg will take that, but changes that happen during construction when you are going through the construction. And, and you wanted to implement new changes in the design. Um, I don't know, the owner wanted to move rooms around and then you are in the process already and that create a lot of conflict with uh, uh, scheduling. And, and that's something that I'm not sure how you approach that on, mm -hmm. on your system, but that's another thing. The other thing that is critical to me when it comes to MEPs is there is never enough room. Exactly. On, <laughs> never enough room on um, for routing, enough room for equipment, for the sizes of the room, for the ceiling space. Especially I work a lot um, at the airport with um, existing condition. And, and when you're working in existing condition, you're stuck in there. You have certain amount of room. And when you have to uh, add new infrastructure, it gets very complicated. So the, co the coordination in there, it gets really, really hard. But it's one thing that I wanted to mention to finalize this. The, that's all, up, all that technical, all construction, all related to the design. But there is one part that is always worries me and is coordination is team disparity, I call it. It's, our team, construction team, is a very large team. The design team is a very small team. And when we get a set of documents that is not finalized, we get our group that is gonna go all over that design and it's gonna create a ton of RFIs and ton of information that need to go back to the design team. And, and there is a conflict in there because usually design team are very small, there's a small fee. Our team is much bigger, has a better, larger fee, 
and we can have 50 people and then we have a team of design that is 10 people mm. that's a real problem for us and i'm going to stop right there all right well I, I'll, say, I'll say something before greg goes because just in, in a similar vein i would say i was going to say mep coordination is the biggest issue when it's not design build more specifically um like what albert was saying I think regardless of if like the drawing set goes to 90% CD or 100% fully spec'd out with a spec manual, MEP plans are typically diagrammatic. So like you said, it's really up to the construction team and specifically the superintendent to finish it and, and sometimes not take the plans literally because they're diagrammatic so to, and so to find the most efficient routing. But sometimes because maybe they don't have experience or they just are afraid to like, to like have a free form and like a sense of creativity. They follow it literally. And then it creates clashes and conflicts because other systems won't fit. And that's what leads to the biggest problems because MEP plans have historically been diagrammatic. So I'm curious if Greg's AI system takes them so that they're not necessarily diagrammatic anymore, but they're actually how it should 100% be routed. That's what right. I'm most interested in. Yeah. So, and that that's amazing because it's not like that right now. Right. Um, yeah, you know, I, I've been in this business longer than I care to admit. Uh, and I, I've seen, <laughs> if anything, a degradation in the quality of general MEP drawings. Um, yep. Back in the old days when before that we had the computers and you were putting ink on mylar, you didn't draw that line unless you knew it fit and you knew exactly where it went. Uh, the, with the advent of computers, it became more and more diagrammatic and it's continued to become more and more diagrammatic, I think primarily due to fee pressure. You know, we're, there's constant pressure to reduce fees, uh, particularly in MEP and architecture, and that is a false economy. Um, you're better off to spend your money planning uh, and then, then dealing with the problems later. Um, now, uh, we are, changing that entire paradigm uh, with our software. Our ultimate goal uh, is to issue subcontractor level shop drawings as the output of the MEP engineering process. We literally wanna issue shop drawings where you can go to your subcontractors and say, hey, go build this. And they, you won't have clashes. Um, our AI system uh, as it presently exists today, we're able to do uh, clash avoidance uh, <coughs> with structure and architectural individually for each discipline. Um, as it exists today, we are still uh, needing to go through and do further clash resolution between the disciplines uh, because we are not able to simulate the, all, all three disciplines at the same time. Um, so we have a, we have a, a hybrid right now uh, where we individually ensure a clash-free design uh, by discipline and then bring the M, P, and E together along with the fire sprinkler uh, and do a full clash resolution using a, either Navisworks or Revit or most likely both. Um, we expect within the next three years to eliminate that process. We are working on software now that will truly route it, uh, all three systems, all systems at the same time uh, it, it, and ensure a clash-free drawing. And once we've got that level of confidence that we know that nothing clashes with architecture, structural, or between the disciplines, then it's a short hop to uh, produce those shop drawings and issue it. We actually did a test project on a very large project in Manhattan uh, where we did just that. We actually issued subcontractor shop drawings prior to bid that the general contractor then went out to bids with and said, here, this is what we want you to build. Uh, we expected uh, initially resistance from the subcontractors because we thought they liked to control that destiny and make those changes. Uh, but in reality, they loved it. They embraced it. They don't, they don't want to do that coordination step either. Um, now, we, we think on that project alone, it cut between six and 12 months of BIM coordination and project uh, problem resolution 
just on the upfront side of it. Uh, what, the other what, thing it did benefited the owner was that um, they were able to bid solid drawings. There wasn't any interpretation. I've heard uh, MEP drawings called cartoons by the contractors, and uh, in some <laughs> cases, it's it's just about what it is. So makes sense. I was going to ask Greg uh, what what size of a job and was it like high rise? What what scale yeah. of the project? Is it was a high rise, a fifty. I believe it was about a fifty four story hotel. Yeah, large okay. project. Yeah. Uh, can, can, can I add something? Um, Absolutely. Um, Alex, uh, you were correct when um, a lot of the MEP is left on to the SOC and the superintendent and the, the people in the field. One of the things that is critical for us now that I'm in the construction field is we we don't want to do anything that is not drawn because it's a liability liability issue. Uh, we have a design team that is uh, that has provided the documents and has gotten the approval from the entities and we don't want to put anything in there that is doesn't have the signature or the, the go ahead or a bulletin or any RFI, any information that it comes from a designer or from from the legal exactly. And that's why that's why the infield coordination is so challenging because the construction team wants to follow the plans as literally as possible, and they might build something and then be like, "Oh shit, that doesn't work with the next system. Let's RFI it." But that's the other inherent issue of build first, ask questions later, which leads us to co like incur more costs. Yeah, yeah, well, that's a different problem. Yeah, it can never happen like that. Yeah, and and that's that's where it becomes very nuanced. Is like, okay, I built it according to the plan, but actually the plan wasn't properly coordinated. So where exactly does the responsibility lie? But the RFI wasn't issued before everything commenced. Yeah. One so, I I love how it's unrolling because this is exactly the 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 tension that you feel in in a project where you know. You have the developer with some interest, you have the engineer and then the architect. I mean, like it or not, not by design, Alberto has been on both sides of this street, like an architect on one side and then the general contractor now on the other side. So I think he can speak to both points of views. Mm -hmm. um, I was going to say, Greg, one important thing that Alberto kind of like touched on, um, where if you do it, where do you draw the line between your design liability and means and methods? Because that's the question I've been asked a number of times when I remember my background is engineering too. So I, I'm all about coordinating and all about like construction. I, I love that stuff. I see the beam models being beautifully, you know, coordinated, but then you go back to the diagrams and you go like, well, yes, the diagrams have been maybe fixed by the coordination, but there's still diagrams that somebody will pick and build with their own means and methods. What would be your point of view about this? Um, well, uh, we we don't uh, we don't intend to get into the actual physical means and methods of how do I assemble this duct, how do I suspend this duct, things like that. Uh, what we're trying to uh, generate is a fully coordinated, clash-free set of drawings. And I don't consider clash-free drawings a means and method. Um, that that is that is engineering, making sure everything fits. Um, so uh, now, I, do I think with AI technology, it'll get to that point? Absolutely, I do. I think we'll be issuing fabrication drawings uh, that they can just build from, uh, but we're not there yet. I mean, I, I, I'm going to just ask a question. I, I think it's very personal because I've been spinning my head around this. Is is providing a routing design where you just no longer draw a line between a plug and a light but you actually draw where it, where the, the piping would fit does that fall into means and methods because you're just saying hey you gotta route it here because here it fits don't do it there because like i read was saying if, if the first guy that shows up he has a whole shaft to do whatever the hell he wants and then he does it but then he messes up with everything else that was supposed to work in a different way all your engineering all your thoughtful progression goes to hell, you know? And then like Alberto said, now you have the problem. So now you have, now you go back to like square one. Uh, mm -hmm. Do you see the difference between like just routing and then everything that goes with means and methods? 
Um, well, let's, uh, let's clarify a couple of things. Um, by we route systems on the mechanical side and the plumbing side, all the way down to the smallest pipes. Uh, but on the electrical side, we route anything two inches and larger. And we do that uh, because uh, the rerouting as necessary of branch circuit wiring, three quarter inch, half inch conduit is very easy. There aren't a lot of rules. You can run it, you know, it can easily bend around everything else. Uh, it's yeah. not, the coordination is not too severe there. Um, now, part of the reason for that actually is the size of the Revit model uh, to, mm -hmm. to do branch circuit uh, routing would be just out of this world. You, it's not manageable. Now, technology will probably advance uh, and the models will become more compact mm -hmm. and we'll be able to actually do branch circuit routing. Um, but the, the thing that we have seen, uh, we've had our software in full scale operation for five or six years now. Uh, and what we're seeing is when we do have shop drawings come back, coordinated shop drawings coming back from the contractors, uh, they're, they're a cold copy of what we drew. Uh, they're not making changes. Um, mm -hmm. The reason the subcontractors like to make changes is because they can find a, a, more, a less expensive way to get it done. Uh, they're yeah. doing it for a financial, the financial incentive of here's a cheaper way, I'll use less material, less time, uh, and I can do it for less. If we've already studied thousands upon thousands of alternatives, the chances of a contractor being able to find some routing solution that's better than what we've shown are very, very slim. I mm. won't say it's inexhaustible, but, uh, it, but it's, it's, in, it's not worth the effort. So we're seeing our shop drawings come back exact matches of what we drew. Mm, sweet. It must feel good. It does. <laughs> Greg, uh, <laughs> is that, I, I, I assume that's for new buildings. Have you had any experience or are you trying on a system building? Because Absolutely. that's a different, totally different animal. Yeah, no, we build it specifically. Our, our, our work profile in our company is about 60% new, 40% remodel. So okay. we built the software specifically to handle existing conditions. Um, mm. So what we do with existing conditions is we've, we, we prefer to do our own on-site verification. Uh, we use digital scan surveys wherever possible. Uh, and we identify the things that can be reused. Uh, anything that can be reused is entered as, a, as, a, as an existing component of the design that the software then can decide is this existing component a part of the most efficient solution or is it better to demo it and you know go take a different route um, so it handles existing uh, just as well as uh, uh, as new conditions um, the only caveat to that would be can we get enough information about structure and architecture um, in advance to be able to accurately model the structure, the existing structure and uh, deal with those kind of clashes. And generally we can, uh, we end up having to make generalizations instead of knowing exactly where every beam is or every joist is, we'll put in you know, the lowest beam or the mm -hmm. highest ceiling and, yeah. and constrict it based on knowns uh, so that we don't have to deal with the unknowns of what might be up there. There might be more space, but we don't count on it. We assume it's not there. Um, and so it works well for that. And that uh, kind of applies to your question earlier, Albert, Alberto, about the, uh, the changes. Uh, we handle changes in a similar way. If a change occurs after, uh, before anything's been designed, uh, constructed, uh, we just rerun the simulation. We make the change on the drawings, we run, rerun the simulations, they're very, very fast. Uh, and we can issue a new design based on the changed plans. That's what would occur, say, between a DD set and a CD set. Um, now, once you're into construction, if you've got it partially built uh, and the owner makes a large change to the floor plan, uh, we're able to take the information as built information from the field and if, identify that as an existing condition and rerun the simulations based on the new plan and what's been installed. It may still tell you to take, take a certain pipe or, uh, or system down, uh, but at least you know that it's part of the best solution. Hmm. Right. I um I would want to hear Alex. I hear you. I mean, I see your eyes, and you're you're thinking a lot. I, I can tell that. Um, in in your experience, and I know you went through a, a challenge with your uh, the Orange Flats uh, project, uh, the design. I I can tell Alex's company is very design oriented, and the projects always have that 
that impressive design that comes with problems because you know if if the if the project is a square box it's always a little easier than if it has all these you know terraces and moving parts and pieces um what can you take alex as, as a learning that if you could have if you had heard this <laughs> before like two, a year ago is there anything you can relate to going back and saying hmm this would have been interesting um well, something i find I think the, the most important thing for any multifamily project as it relates to MEP, if it's not design built, is layout reviews while you're under construction and towards the end of rough framing so that each of the subcontractors who typically might not be the same company, mechanical, electrical, plumbing, as well as the executive architect and the construction team go to every single unit type and mark their territory so one person doesn't domineer over the other from commencing first. And I think that actually would have avoided a lot of my problems because regardless of an elaborate design, we we tried to design the interior to stack as much as possible. So a lot of issues that I might have un, I might have had to deal with shouldn't have happened because of the elaborate design. It happens because of problems during construction. And also to Albert's point, it gets very tricky whenever there were MEP changes during construction. For instance, we had an approved plan set. And for instance, for the like in our kitchens, we have um, ventless hoods, which was approved in the old code. But ever since our plans were stamped and construction commenced, the city doesn't want to allow that anymore. So the inspector who we're at the mercy of is like, oh, even though it was approved, I don't like this anymore, go back to plan check. So that requires a whole new effort while we're under construction and can severely hamper our schedule because now we have to reroute stuff, redesign stuff, go through plan check while we try to do anything else we can so it doesn't cause a bottleneck in the construction timeline. But the issue now is things changed with the MEP design. And for instance, we have all these access panels that are that have been stuffed into the bathroom, for instance. And for me, the biggest issue is if there's one engineer that is doing MEP, you don't make a change on the mechanical set and not coordinate that in-house with, for instance, your electrical engineer. Because now one of the issues I'm facing is we have like a multitude of access panels given the updated code, let's say in a bathroom, but there's no space for overhead lighting anymore. So I'm like, why did you put the HVAC unit in the bathroom? It's all these types of things where, and I, I honestly, I'm shocked by Greg's model. And I'm, I, I'm, I already just texted my architect to hire him for this project I'm, I'm starting design on. I hope you do multifamily, but it's all these things where I think I agree with whatever. Someone said that MEP drawings used to be drawn out. I think that there was much more quality to that. I think that people just don't, the new engineers of today don't have the same understanding and they don't know what they're doing. So it causes problems for us. And the issue too is you cannot get design build for every scale of project. So we're at the mercy of these engineers and construction team. And mm. everyone knows that people love playing the blame game in this mm. industry. So as a developer, I can only do, I can only make the best decision and keep the ship moving forward, but there's no time to fight with everyone. That kind of like leads into my next question that I had uh, written for today. I recall when I started, which again, uh, it's been 20 years now, um, the title blocks had like the architect, the civil engineer, structural, MEP, maybe landscape. That was it. That was the title block. You pick a title block today. How many consultants do we have in that list? maybe 25 consultants like there's there's more and more like specialties and and more people so it, it only gets worse because as much as some systems may be easier to fit once the rest are done you're still stacking more and more people so my question was from from, from each one of these three very somehow different points of views and, and to talk to the people that have joined today, which are more, more like professionals who are trying to learn about the, the coordination from the professional services, right? We're, we're mostly talking to people that are service providers, like maybe architects, engineers, and, and they have to deal with this. But if you have to be more of the project manager and you have to face this, I wrote, like, what would be that 
um, one skill that comes to your mind if, if you need one person today to help cope with this complexity? What would that skill be? I'll tell you from my side, and it's something that I was saying at the beginning when everybody was not hadn't joined yet, but collaborative, you must be a collaborative person. Um, and, and I was saying my role over here is to be, um, as a design manager, to be in between parties and be the negotiator of different parties uh, between all the side, between all the client, uh, the approval entities. You gotta have the skill to be a person that can communicate with everyone and be willing to work with everyone. That are people that take it sometimes to the extreme and they don't wanna, they get to a position that they cannot move on from there. And, that doesn't resolve the problem, it gets you stuck. You have to be open-minded, you have to be collaborative um, and communicate uh, with everybody. And so before the rest can give you the, I'll, I'll make the double question question. And so one, one, non, one, one lack of skill, one thing you wanna absolutely avoid, one like say one personality feature that that can ruin your job if you're in that position what would that be what what, what do we want to stay away from so I, I can say like i completely agree with alberto in every way because i think the the project manager needs to be a proactive communicator and accept the current circumstance of where everyone is at with like let's say the design flaw and not point fingers, but just try to proactively go towards a solution. And in that vein, they cannot be short tempered because that'll never lead to anything. So they have to be very patient with everyone. That, that's what I would say one skill is. I totally that. agree. The yeah. haters in a way, <laughs> you cannot have them. Lingo, yeah. Yeah, um, you know, uh, I think the most important skill, and it ties into what Alberto and Alex have already said, is maintaining the schedule uh, and and the interrelationships between all those consultants. You know, you've got the lighting, the spa, the pool, landscaping, civil, kitchen, uh, equipment, interior decor. There's just a tremendous list of of consultants that all have to be coordinated, and you need someone who's maintaining a master schedule, and that person, it needs to be a single entity uh, that maintains a schedule. And then all of the consultants provide what their necessary requirements are and, an, and a timeline of when they need them in order to hit the schedule. And then maintaining that schedule and making sure that the, you know, the, the kitchen uh, uh, consultant provides sufficient MEP rough-in information for the MEP to be able to, to do his work and, and so on. Um, that would be the biggest uh, coordination issue you, that we run into. Um, uh, I often have clients say, you know, how, how quickly can you deliver this project? What's your schedule? And I said, my schedule is entirely dictated by information flow. Uh, the information flowing in is where, is where we get hung up. If we don't have rough ends for the kitchen, we can't design the kitchen. Uh, and I think, and that, that needs to be, there needs to be a, a master controller of that uh, schedule. In a design build, uh, I think that's the role of the, over, the master general contractor. Uh, in a design bid build, uh, I think the role is, uh, falls squarely on the architect. Uh, but you need someone who's organized and diligent in making sure that the information flow is happening in a timely fashion. Uh, I'm glad you touched on the schedule that goes also to the client because clients need to go along with that schedule and need to provide the answers that you need to continue your design. And uh, the approval entities, we have a big problem with COVID. Um, all the cities shut down, uh, a process that it, we had the over-the-counter permit now that it was a couple of days, now it takes three months to get it done. So um, uh, schedule is critical uh, and you have to have the right person, the right people uh, managing that. Generally speaking on most projects, schedule overrides everything because if Alex facility opens one month late, that one month of rent probably supersedes all the, 
all the uh, changes yep. that could occur during and construction, schedules the driver. You've got I, to get that building open and generating revenue. Uh, and the only way to do that is to maintain a schedule. And the schedule is very tricky whenever you sign like a GMP contract, because as I'm sure you guys know, the GC will do everything in their power to try to get uh, uh, agreed upon, you know, owner related delay by claiming any sort of the issues we already discussed in this webinar about MEP routing or coordination misses, inclement weather, anything that won't make them fall into the liquidated damages provision. But it mm -hmm. is, but I will say, I think more than, I think the schedule squarely falls on the GC and the ownership. I feel like the architect beyond having some sort of understanding of the submittal schedule, beyond that, I think it's really up to the GC and ownership to drive the schedule and have weekly updates to it to make sure that we're conforming. And also it's up to the owner's, the owner's representative or the owner's PM or CM to foresee bottlenecks and problems that could happen to counteract them. Like for instance, just, I think what I learned in my, my earlier projects is that I want the bottleneck submittals to be approved before I ever break ground. One instance is a lot of GCs sometimes don't even read the specifications for the project and <clears throat> misprice certain aspects of the GMP. But for instance, if, if, if there is no agreement on the roofing submittal, let's say, and it's a very intricate system that the GC has never worked with, but a lot of GCs have and a lot of architects propose, I want that approved before I start construction because I don't want to wait four months for multiple submittals to be rejected and then my schedule to be delayed. And then let's say we end up in rainy season. The mm. project isn't insulated. None of the interior works can start and it's just a disaster. So yeah. I was going to ask, if uh, if the if the blame was always on the owner developer, but I remember Alex is here, so I'm gonna skip that question. <laughs> no, go ahead, ask it. That's a good one. That's a good one. Well, you know, it's funny, but I was gonna say, and and Alberto touched on that matter is, it, it, it's it's hard to pin uh, where the where the the spark that ignites the 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 chain of changes is because sometimes it's and I have worked with a lot of architects and I have seen some architectural firms with the project leader thinking of a change at 50% CDs. And I reacted saying there, there's no way you're thinking about that now. I mean, it's, 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 there's, it's, but then I've also heard the story where the client wakes up one morning and says, yesterday I saw this Netflix show and this beautiful building in Mexico had this, and I won something along the lines of that. So now it's everybody, you know, running around that. In, in your views from where you're here, do, do you think there's a, a consistent kind of like more uh, like trendy source of change being the owner changing their minds and never making that, that signature saying, I approve this and then I'm not changing it versus the design team maybe, and, and maybe more so the architect, uh, kind of like never feeling comfortable with the design. If you had to say one or two, is there, one or two, or it's a combination, or it depends. What would be your experience on this? Um, I think it's it, it's definitely a combination, but uh, I, I I would say it's heavily weighted towards owner owner indecision, not not so much necessarily changing, but not making not wanting to make the decision and move forward with that decision solidly. Uh, so vacillation on the part of the owner is a is a driver of a lot of changes. Have um, you heard, let me ask one question, Greg. Um, I, I don't I don't I don't really understand. Uh, remember, if you do work mostly with developers, or you also work with companies that that just build the building, because there's, there's a difference between a developer that understands the dynamics of buildings and they know the product that they're putting in the market, blah blah blah, versus like Alberto, he's working on the airport. And the airlines want a better lounge for their passengers. And they don't know much about construction cost changes and whatnot. They just, they maybe have a budget, but then if they spend 2 million bucks in an additional area of the lounge, lounge then maybe they make even more money out of that. So their, their, their business dynamics is, is different. Do you see that as a difference between, you know, developers who are very strict on the business of building versus companies that have another driver in their business? Um, I think it's primarily based on uh, experience. Uh, 
um, a very an experienced developer knows what he's doing. He knows what his product is. He knows what his market is, and he makes decisions early on, and it sticks to him. Uh, a less experienced owner or developer, whether it's a whether it's an airport authority or whether it's a retailer or whether it's a, a, a mixed use uh, mixed use developer, it's all about experience and knowing knowing your market, knowing where you're going, and then sticking the staying the course and not changing it. Not trying to adapt to the uh, the latest thing you saw in Mexico. All right, all right. I, would you then recommend? And, and maybe Alex, I, I want to hear from you because you've you've gained a lot of experience in a relatively short period of time. I, I will want to hear from you if you see yourself going through that, um, like you know, grounding yourself in being more consistent in your decisions. But before I do that, um, I wanted to ask you, Greg, when you approach a client in your, I don't know if you do a, a, a like a process driven, um, like due diligence, or you just sense if the client is, is this an important parameter when you're talking to a new client and the client says, this is the person that will be running this, would that be something to spot? Like is the person seasoned and grounded they know or not? Because that will drive you crazy or not. Is that something you place attention to when you interview with a new client? Um, yeah. I, I would say it does factor into our fee determination when we're dealing with the client. We can tell whether they are really solid in their in their conceptual design or whether it's in flux. Um, and a lot of our clients are architects. Uh, often we're a subcontractor, the architect. So we get used to the, the firm and we know how they operate and we can anticipate what how the project's going to go. Uh, that affects our timelines. Uh, it affects how much information we demand at, and at what times, um, and it affects our fee. Yeah, so Alex, um, what, what's your experience in these few years that you've been doing so much? I think like going off of what other people said, this business on the development side is not for the faint of heart and indecision kills deals. So one thing that I learned to do quite well, I would say, is be extremely decisive and lead the design and construction teams forward with my decision making. And it, it is a matter of just taking all the inputs and spitting something out while it's almost like staying at 30,000 feet. What's the best decision to keep the project going? You could dive into a detail, but you can't stay down. You have to go back up and keep going forward. So I would say you need to be extremely decisive, but you can only be decisive if you're confident that you know what you're doing and that also that also comes with having the team the right team behind me that guides me on certain aspects where i know what i don't know so i can't really make a decision without their quick input hmm. interesting well so said we're, alex well said alex yeah. decisive let me, owner let is, me, uh, you need to be that's, that's critical critical. It's critical not always happen and and i'm going to tell you something in on our side, we, we're very clear that you can have, you can change your mind or you can have changes because for a million reasons, you can come back and do a change on your project. I think we need to be open to that. And we consider that from the beginning, we are willing to do all the changes you would like to, as long as that is reflected. If the schedule allows for that, we'll do it. That's in our company, that's not a problem. And we always consider, we're, we, we know that changes are going to happen. We're not against them. We just want to make sure that their, their, their decision doesn't take forever and that we can frame it within the schedule. But if it's going to take beyond the schedule, it's a conversation that we will have with the owner and say, yeah, you yeah. know, this, it, it will require that. And it's it's just a matter of being open to it. Um, so we're we're approaching kind of like the, the end. I have one more uh, thing I wanted to do. We're we're gonna let people ask questions and okay, if they if they, if anybody has any questions, let me know. But um basically you said something changes will happen. I I remember for a few years I was following this Dakar race, uh, motorbike race, and these two guys, uh, a Spanish guy and a French guy, won like 11 in a row between the two. It's like nobody else could beat them until they retired. 
And once they were asking the guy, I mean, this is a 15 day race, like how, what's the secret? He's like, a lot of people approach the race hoping there will be no problems and you have to approach the race <laughs> after problems and, and figuring out what's the best way to be prepared to solve the problems. And that, that kind of like stuck to me because in a way you have to be prepared for trouble. If you're in this industry, there will never be an easy project. Um, that's where we picked up our Corby's line of, we like to do business with people. We would have a glass of wine with because at the end of the day, you have those rough days and you should be able to finish that rough day and still like each other, you know, still be able or willing to, to spend that time together. Um, I do believe in relationships. I think I'm hoping the AI and I'm hoping the beam technology will help us have a better experience working, like lessening that friction uh, between all these components. Um, and so my last question to you guys and okay let me know if there's any uh, question from uh, people but i wanted to ask you this one that somebody asked me once and i think it's a good one um what is the question i didn't ask that i should have asked that's that's hard um w one th one thing i think that gets off neglected uh, is the, the end of the construction cycle and the commissioning and handoff of the building, uh, particularly in the MEP systems. Um, people tend to believe that, well, it was built according to plan, uh, it, it was installed using manufactured equipment, everything's fine, don't worry about it. Uh, so there's a reluctance to go in and commission a building, um, particularly on the smaller projects. Um, but it's been our experience that every single time we find things that are not right. It's, we've never seen a perfectly constructed project. We've never seen a perfectly operated building. Uh, and that last stage of handoff to the owner, commissioning the systems and making sure it's actually working according to spec would save so much headache down the road. Hmm. So I think that's one piece that gets missed. It's a big item. We have a whole group in our company dedicated to that, only commissioning and making sure that everything is working properly. It's, it's, it's a very good point. And, and Martin, what you said before is you got to pre be prepared for unexpected issues, problem, you cannot go into a project thinking that everything is gonna be smooth and everything you're gonna design it and it's gonna get built and it's gonna be done in the time that you plan it, that doesn't happen. Maybe with the programs uh, Greg is creating and we put that into the engineers and the architect too. And we, my goal, and I've been dreaming about telling the computer that I want a building that is like this size and this size and give it a certain parameter and the computer tell me and give me all the detail, but that's going to happen another 50 years, 100 years. But until that time, the road is not easy. It's not yeah. a smooth road. I would, I would say I've learned things never or rarely go according to plan. So the quality of the team is how you problem solve and mitigate the risk because if you don't know how to problem solve and de-risk the projects in all aspects, then what are you really doing? It's really like a meaningless profession. Um, so you really have to have open mind because you think it's going to go linear, but it just is like this the whole time. And it's really, a, each project is a journey. So you have to buckle up. <laughs> <clears throat> buckle up. I like that. Buckle up. I was thinking, what do I do? I, I want to do t-shirts with a fun thing. Uh, buckle up will be. Buckle up. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> all right guys uh we're like 10 minutes to the hour uh so still i was asking here if if you don't mind sharing as a wrap-up note uh we know alex where your projects are but if you don't mind sharing but also alberto the projects you're working on and greg just a, a quick summary of what you guys are uh, on and then we'll wrap it up and thank everybody for joining so alex if you don't mind just share your your two three projects outline and then the same thing uh, would be interesting to hear yeah, so um, I started out doing projects in Central Hollywood, which is technically city of Los Angeles. Um, 
And now I'm doing work in the city of West Hollywood, which presents its own challenges. But it's interesting because people have a stigma that West Hollywood has traditionally been very difficult to deal with and almost like NIMBY. But um, to everyone's like disbelief, that perception has changed and they are really welcoming development. And actually, when you work with a smaller <coughs> municipality, you're able to actually move sometimes much quicker through the permitting and entitlement process than you would in like a bigger place like city of LA. Um, and yeah, a lot of my business also revolves around taking advantage of updates to the, for, I'm in California, so to the state housing laws to streamline the approval and permitting process and not allow nimbyism or, you know, just adverse activism to stop my plans for housing. Uh, you, you, Alex, to, uh, I, sorry, yeah. you have to say something else. No. Okay. So well, you said something very important about the cities because I work at the airport right now and large project that renovations that we have and, and the airport is going on forever. The airport is an entity that it yes. renovates itself every 20 years. You finish a project another 20 years, you're still working in something else and it keep going. But we have Los Angeles, uh, the building and safety department has their own office at the airport. We, they have trailers and we have the whole group over here, MEPs, uh, architect, engineer. I mean, the whole group and we approve our drawings through this location in here. We don't have to go to downtown, although we do for certain parts, but that's how big this mm, LA right. is and, and our project. So, and, and to, to your first question, um, Martin, I work at the airport, that's one of my projects. And then um, a big hospital, Harvard, UCLA hospital, I'm working on that as well right now, which is it's a little bit different, but I work in my life in, in all well, kinds of projects. So it's, 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 it's fine. So at the end, you're either taking off or you end up in the hospital. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> I'll do both. <laughs> right. uh, Greg? You know, yeah, right? well, well, as I, I mentioned at the beginning, uh, we have offices uh, in all over the country. We have six offices, New York, uh, Miami, Omaha, Los Angeles, Seattle, and Honolulu. Uh, and our project mix is incredibly diverse um, from high-rise multifamily, uh, particularly in the, in the South Florida markets uh, to uh, high-rise office and a lot of uh, interior TIs in the New York area, LA's all over the map. Uh, so uh, it's hard to classify exactly what we're doing. Uh, we do approximately a thousand total projects company-wide uh, and they range in size from uh, retail rollouts of a few thousand square feet uh, up to, you know, multi-million square foot uh, mixed use facilities. Sweet, sweet. All right, as I said before, we start sharp, we finish sharp. I appreciate uh, having you guys here. I've taken a lot of notes and um, I don't know, I, I just cannot thank you enough for, for sharing your experience and your time. And I hope everybody that joined took uh, a lot of notes as I did. Uh, we're having the next one uh, in April, which is going to spin around some of these things, uh, you know, we spoke about today, uh, basically, how do we get projects delivered? So having said that, thank you again so much, everybody for joining. Thank you, Elke, for putting it together. And Greg, Alberto, and Alex, thank you so, so much for sharing your expertise and opinions. And thank I you see for you having us. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, All right. Bye. Thank you.